Well, welcome to the College of Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series on Race, Equity, and Justice. I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities and professor in the newly renamed Harriet Tubman Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. This morning is the final colloquium of the semester in the series that's been part of our broader initiative on race, equity, and social justice developed around the goal of understanding and dismantling structural racism. Strategies have inclu include transforming curriculum and scholarship, reducing discrimination in teaching, research, and service, and expanding the impact of ARHU's longstanding and continuing research and scholarship on racism, anti-racism, equity, and justice. Also consistent with President Pine's call to focus on race and identity as we welcome new members of our community. We are pleased to have students participating with us this morning as part of the new Terrapin Strong onboarding program. In our view, part of our approach is to offer opportunities for the students to be exposed to the many different ways faculty and scholars in the college study and teach about these issues. As those of you who have watched throughout the semester, you know that in this series, I invite faculty experts from across the college to discuss their scholarship and creative projects related to anti-racism and social justice. The format of each session includes a brief presentation followed by conversation with me and then an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, we do have some plans. We will continue this in the spring semester. So stay tuned for information about that. And we look forward to having you and many of your friends and colleagues join us. So for this morning, we're gonna ask that your microphones remain on mute for this part of the program. Uh, during the last 20 minutes, you'll be invited to submit questions through the chat, which is being moderated by Associate Dean Linda Aldori, who will manage the Q&A. And please note the event is being recorded for future viewing on our Hughes website. So today's session features Dr. Richard Bell, Professor of History. Dr. Bell has published three books and authored monograph, We Shall Be No More, Suicide and Self-Government in the Newly United States, a co-edited volume of essays, Buried Lives, Incarcerated in Early America, and the one he will be discussing today. He has held research fellowships at more than two dozen libraries and institutes. And over the last decade, he has served as a fellow at Cambridge University, Yale University, Library of Congress, and as an NEH fellow at the American Antiquarian Society. He is a frequent speaker on C-SPAN and for the Smithsonian Institute, at the Smithsonian Institution. His talk today centers on his book, Stolen, Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home. The book is a recipient of a 2017 NEH Public Scholar Award. It is also a finalist for the coveted George Washington Prize, one of the nation's largest and most prestigious literary awards, and the Harriet Tubman Prize, sponsored by the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library. So we are really delighted um, to have uh, Rick with us this morning and even more pleased and proud to have him as a member of us, our faculty and to share his expertise. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the program over to Dr. Richard Bell. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, thank you to the Dean. Thank you to the Associate Dean for inviting me here for this opportunity to speak about uh, what is research that's recently completed. Uh, this is no longer work in progress. This is out there in the world between hardcover, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use my 15, 20 minutes at the top of this hour to give a sort of very abbreviated, um, I guess, book talk, I guess might be one way to think about it, uh, and then pitch things over uh, to the Dean and to you all to see what it provokes um, in you. So thank you for this opportunity. Let me begin by sharing my screen uh, here. Always a moment of truth for any Zoom um, presenter. I hope that Ashley will let me know if there's anything dodgy on my screen that, or it looks good, um, but I'm going to just plow ahead as we often do on the Zoom. So 
this obviously is sobering stuff because Cornelius Sinclair was 10 years old and he was trapped. He was stuck, he was locked in the belly of a small ship that looked a bit like this one, that was bobbing in the middle of the Delaware River a mile south of Philadelphia. A man had grabbed this 10 year old kid from a spot near Philadelphia's market an hour ago, shoved a black gag across his mouth, tossed him into a wagon down to the docks and hauled him aboard. And it was dark below the ship's waterline, but 10 year old Cornelius could see enough to know that he was not the only child locked down there. <clears throat> Four pairs of eyes stared back at him. Four other African-American children, one definitely younger than him, none of them older than 16. Yesterday, all five boys had been free, like you and me. But today they were slaves prisoners of a gang of child snatchers who plan to sell their lives and their labor, most likely to plantation owners in the deep south. If their abductors got away with this, 10-year-old Cornelius would spend the rest of his life as someone else's property, somewhere very far away. He would probably never see his family again. Cornelius Sinclair disappeared in late August of 1825 one of dozens of African-American children to vanish in very similar circumstances from Philadelphia that single year. In the early 1800s, the city was the hub of American slavery's blackest market. Its gridded streets and its tangled alleys were hunting grounds for crews of professional kidnappers who made their livings turning free black children like Cornelius into Southern slaves. And they did this work swiftly and shamelessly in brazen affront to Philadelphia's reputation at the time, not only as the city of brotherly love, but also as a safe haven for people of color and as the headquarters of America's anti-slavery movement. But of course, to criminals, to kidnappers, none of that stuff mattered. And in truth, early 19th century Philadelphia was probably one of the most dangerous places to be free and black anywhere in the United States. And this was a product of its location. It was the nearest major free city to the slave South. Philadelphia lay just, what, 40 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line, the boundary that separated Pennsylvania's free soil from several slave states to its South. And Philadelphia's proximity to that frontier line made its many free black residents attractive targets for professional people snatchers from nearby slave states. They would come to Philadelphia and prey on the members of the city's free black community relentlessly, putting bullseyes on their backs and putting prices on their heads. And the people they stole away from freedom could fetch anywhere up to $15,000 per person in today's money in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, three of the new territories and states that were rising up along the Gulf Coast at exactly this time. The American settlers swarming into that region demanded a nearly bottomless supply of forced labor to cut sugarcane and pick cotton and would take almost anyone to do that unpaid work. Now, buying a small percentage of their black laborers from kidnappers of free people was not likely their first choice, but planters' options down there were somewhat limited. Planters in the Deep South had been forced to look to American sources for their manpower needs ever since 1808, the year that lawmakers in Washington had passed legislation outlawing any further imports of uh, black people from Africa or the Caribbean for the purposes of enslaving them in the United States. That 1808 decision was a major turning point in the history of enslavement in America. One that spurred the growth of an American internal domestic slave trade within the United States. After that 1808 decision, interstate slave traders here in the US tried to satisfy those Southwestern settlers demand for black labor by bringing them thousands of American born enslaved people 
each year from existing slave states like Maryland and Virginia, where some uh, slave owners were in surplus, in quotation marks. But settlers down in the Deep South wanted even more. And the stronger the demand, the more tempting, the more profitable it became for anyone sufficiently cold-blooded to try to kidnap free children like Cornelius from northern cities like Philadelphia, smuggle them into that legal supply chain, and then sell them in that vast new southwestern slave market. Those economic incentives left Philadelphia's large and dynamic free black community dangerously exposed. And by 1825, the city of brotherly love had become the center of an inter-regional kidnapping operation. It had become a northern terminus of something I call America's reverse underground railroad. So this reverse underground railroad, which again is the kidnapping and trafficking into slavery of free African Americans from within the United States, and it's much better known namesake, the Underground Railroad. As you all know, they ran in basically opposite directions and for completely different purposes. But because they were opposites, they're also in some ways mirror images of one another. On the Underground Railroad, enslaved people would abandon Southern plantations and trek northward, dreaming of new lives and new opportunities and freedom. But on America's reverse underground railroad, free black people were stolen from northern cities like Philadelphia and were made to trudge southward to be sold into plantation slavery. Both of these networks, one I think heroic and courageous, the other I think evil and monstrous, roared to life in the early 1800s to exploit what by then had become major differences in the legal status of slavery in the North and in the South. Both networks were loosely organized and highly opportunistic. They ran on secrecy. They relied on small circles of trusted participants, forged documents, false identities and disguise. The direction of travel on these two networks was usually very different, but the routes taken by freedom seekers and by victims of kidnapping were sometimes the same and they might even have passed one another on certain roads from time to time. And what's more, the volume of traffic on these two networks was roughly the same size. Each year, each one carried hundreds of black adults and children across state lines. Most of us, I hope, know a lot about the Underground Railroad. Uh, and if you don't, there's a, a department recently renamed in honor of one of its most famous conductors that you can check out. The achievements of folks like Harriet Tubman now command our attention, which is long overdue. And there are walking tours, television shows, and museums all dedicated to the Underground uh, Railroad and its most famous conductor, Harriet Tubman. We know far less, I think, about what I call America's reverse Underground Railroad. Its conductors, its station agents worked tirelessly to remain untouchable. And the identities of all but a handful of these criminals still remain a secret, even today. They certainly never gave um, public lectures about their work. They never went on fundraising tours. Only rarely do their names and their crimes even appear in police files or trial transcripts that low profile and surviving legal sources, the result of the years they spent in the shadows, protected by bribes, corruption, and too much indifference and apathy among ordinary Americans who knew what they were up to. They left no business records, no bundles of private papers. They didn't write memoirs. They didn't pose for paintings or photographs leaving activists, journalists to guess, as you see here, at what they might have looked like. But as I argue in this recent book, Stolen, the kidnappers who built America's reverse underground railroad nonetheless left their mark everywhere on 19th century America. Stealing away, all told, maybe tens of thousands of free black people, many of them children, 
like Cornelius. And let me be clear, most of those they kidnapped were never heard from again. Their families and friends searched frantically, lobbied, petitioned, advertised. They waited in earnest for news, but usually nothing came. Free black people in northern cities like Philly had few white allies in this period beyond the meager ranks of a handful of Quaker-led anti-slavery societies. What's more, white employers openly discriminated against African-American job applicants, while city constables, policemen, generally ignored people of color's complaints. So when children like Cornelius went missing, their parents could hardly ever persuade mayors or magistrates or policemen to get involved. It was rarer still for anyone to be able to gather enough evidence to issue arrest warrants, search property and interrogate suspects. And even then, experienced members of these many different kidnapping crews, they knew exactly what to do and what to say to talk their way out of trouble and to get back to work. I'm guessing all 62 of us have heard of 12 Years a Slave. As you'll remember, 12 Years a Slave was the name of a movie based on a memoir written by a guy named Solomon Northup, who of course was one of the tens of thousands of people subjected, caught up in, ensnared in America's reverse underground railroad. Unlike almost everyone else though, Northup later escaped his enslavement, though it took him 12 years to do it. And when he did, he returned home and then he wrote about it. And in that memoir written in 1853, 12 Years a Slave, Northup explains what riding America's reverse underground railroad was like for him. He explains how a pair of well-dressed white con men lured him and he was a well-educated, prosperous musician in his mid thirties into New York City from his home in upstate New York in 1841. And down in Manhattan, they wined him, dined him, and of course drugged him and then sold him to an interstate slave trader in Washington, DC. Northup was soon forced onto a slave ship bound for New Orleans. And there he was sold in that city, one of, the, one of that city's infamous slave marts to a planter who then put him to work in his sugarcane fields. In 2013, that powerful Oscar-winning film based on Northup's extraordinary autobiography drew overdue attention to that ordeal, to his ordeal. But both the memoir and the movie offer, I think, distorted, maybe even misleading views of who the agents of America's reverse underground railroad usually targeted and how they usually made their money. Because it turns out that Northup's experience on America's reverse underground railroad was not at all typical of everyone else's. Kidnappers actually rarely approached highly literate, middle-aged men in their thirties like Northup. No, kidnappers preferred instead to lure away poorly educated street kids with ruses that could swiftly separate them from their families. Very few of their captives traveled by ship to New Orleans either. Instead, kidnappers forced most boys and girls to trek southward on foot in small specialized overland convoys known as coffles. And their prisoners rarely ended up in showrooms or on the auction block. Their prisoners were vastly more likely to be sold off along the way in furtive all cash deals to hard up planters in the interior of the cotton kingdom who wanted to buy more slaves, but who were too cheap to pay big city New Orleans slave prices. All of that was, all of that was what was typical on America's reverse underground railroad. And all of that is almost exactly what happened to 10 year old Cornelius Sinclair, one of the five central figures in my book. In August of 1825, Cornelius and Sam and Enos and Alex and Joe, five boys, fell into the hands of 19th century America's most fearsome gang 
of kidnappers. Their captors hustled them onto a ship just outside Philadelphia, which is in the top right of this map. Their captors warehoused them for a while in a pair of safe houses down on the Delaware, Maryland line, just above the word Nanticote at the bottom of your screen is the location of those safe houses. And then their kidnappers marched them halfway across this vast continent towards the deep south where they tried to sell them all as slaves. This was a soul destroying journey. This is a journey of 2 million children's footsteps. In the interest of time, I have to pass over much of it here. And likewise, I'm gonna pass over the book's second half in which some, but not all of these five boys make a miraculous escape and begin the astonishing odyssey home to Philadelphia referred to in the book's subtitle. An odyssey home that would ultimately encompass two murders, three exhumations of dead bodies, an escape, a recapture, a suicide, a race riot, a lawsuit, the nation's first most wanted list, and America's largest manhunt so far. But instead of spilling the beans, of what happens in the second half of the book? Let me quickly wrap up with a couple of reflections about why I think learning about America's reverse Underground Railroad is important. To begin with, I would argue forcefully that black lives have always mattered and so any true story about free children ripped from their families and swallowed up by American slavery is a story worth reconstructing for its own damning sake. But the remarkable ordeal that Cornelius and Enos and Sam and Alex and Joe endured also demands our attention, I think, for many other reasons. For one thing, it serves as a pointed reminder that in the decades before the American Civil War, child snatching was heartbreakingly frequent in northern towns and cities, and black freedom was achingly fragile. It demonstrates too the important role that this grotesque trade in kidnapped free people played in accelerating the spread of American slavery into the deep south over the same period. Now, as I said, I'm not gonna spill all the beans about the book's astonishing, unexpected and strange second half, but I will drop a few big hints now. And I will say that the dogged efforts of everyone involved in trying to save Cornelius and the four other boys from the horrors of slavery in the Southwest would have profound consequences, radicalizing African-American communities across the free states and inspiring African-Americans to embrace bold new tactics in the cause of their own self-defense and mutual protection. Their efforts would reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well by encouraging white abolitionists like the two white women who wrote this children's anti-slavery alphabet to focus the Northern reading public's attention on the suffering of black families being forcibly separated by kidnappers, by slave catchers, by slave traders, by slavery itself. But most immediately, outrage over the abduction of these five boys would force lawmakers in Pennsylvania to pass a tough new anti-kidnapping measure known as a personal liberty law. And this 1826 Pennsylvania personal liberty law would enrage Southerners and slaveholders more so than any other state law passed before the Civil War. And it set in motion a chain of court challenges and political retaliations against it that culminated in the passage through the Federal Congress of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a pro-slavery abomination of a law that put this country on a collision course with civil war. That lasting legacy, however, must never be allowed to obscure the urgent stakes of this particular story. A 10-year-old boy 
and four other free children were dragged into slavery in 1825. They would have to fight like hell to try to escape. I will stop there. Thanks very much for uh, listening and turn things back over to the Dean. Thank you, uh, Rick. I think that does require a deep breath uh, after listening to that story. Um, so I guess the first question that I have of you is how did you get to this work? How did you, well, how did you discover the story, but what led you to um, this exploration and how did you learn about Cornelius? Yeah, it's, uh, I've spent almost 10 years uh, with uh, Cornelius. We've been on a journey together. Um, I was working on a previous book. You mentioned it in your intro. It was about a different topic, an equally uh, important dark topic. It was about suicide in American history between the revolution and the Civil War. And as I was finishing up work for that project, Bonnie, uh, I came across the, um, um, I came across the alleged suicide of uh, a woman who was in jail in rural Delaware in 1829, so four years after the events in Stolen in 1825, um, who may or may not have committed suicide as a way to escape the hangman because she was facing murder charges. Um, this woman's name was Patty Cannon, a name I'd never heard before, um, though a name, by the way, still quite well known on the eastern shore of Maryland today. Um, and as I began digging into the circumstances of her death and whether or not she committed suicide, I became aware of the circumstances of her life, that for the previous 20 years, she had been the co-leader of the most prolific and most infamous, meaning, you know, well-known gang of um, uh, child snatchers and human traffickers anywhere in the United States. Uh, well-known enough that Frederick Douglass knew who she was. I would bet you money that Harriet Tubman knew who she was. I would bet you money John Quincy Adams, the president of the United States, had heard her name. She was that well known. Um, and I had not heard of her. And I had not been aware back in 2011 when I came across her name, Bonnie, that, um, um, that the kidnapping and enslavement of free African-American people uh, eking out free lives in northern states on what is gingerly called free soil at this time. Um, was common. I had read Solomon Northup's account, but I'd assumed what happened to him was extremely rare, exceptional. And as I began digging into Patty Cannon's life and her gang's monstrous career, I became aware that her gang was one of dozens of these gangs all across the northern and borderland United States. And that all told, they were responsible for a massive amount of um, um, uh, kidnappings and traffickings into slavery. And um, uh, this was not my first rodeo back in 2011, right? Um, I had been a practicing historian for a while by then, and I figured if I didn't know this stuff, then maybe other people didn't know this as well. So I wrote this book to educate myself about this phenomenon, uh, and then to share my findings with as many people as possible. So one of the things I know, um, I know you don't want to spill the beans. <laughs> But one of the things that strikes me about this is that the, the part of the story that you have shared with us is a story that's fairly familiar in terms of, um, well, free African-Americans, that may not be as familiar to people as others, but uh, taken into slavery and victims of a very uh, vicious system. But you also suggest that the second half of the book tells a different story, not of Africans as victims, but as kind of, um, as, as victorious in some ways in terms of, of their own. So I wondered if you could just, and, and I had noted that the, um, the, the, the notes on the Harriet Tubman Award website um, say that you tell this incredible story of these five boys whose courage forever changed the fight against slavery in America. 
And I wondered if you could just give an example or speak to that bigger issue a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I mean, um, uh, I, I'm not skittish about talking about what happens in the book. I just don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it um, uh, yet. Because uh, as I said, you know, things that don't normally happen, uh, happen here. And let me, let me start by framing that. Um, uh, it's, there's a lot of structural obstacles to, um, to being courageous, uh, to, to fighting back, to gaining uh, freedom, right? To returning home. Um, kidnappers um, like this gang, and I just uh, told the Dean that this gang has been active for 20 years, right? They're very good, sadly, at what they do. They get away with it more times than not. They're not afraid to use the threat of violence and violence itself to bend the law, to bribe um, uh, policemen, and they operate on the borderlands between the slave states and the free states, and they're very aware of what that jurisdictional jumping around uh, means in terms of their own legal um, protections, right? There's a reason their headquarters is on the Maryland-Delaware line and not in, you know, Pennsylvania or somewhere else. So there's a lot of um, ways in which it's very hard to assert the um, the urge for freedom, uh, for, for liberty, which burns inside all of us, uh, slave or free, um, black and white. So, and yet we know that anytime we study enslavement up close, uh, we can find um, we can find that fire burning. We just have to look for it, right? Um, and in this particular case, it burns incredibly brightly and is hard to miss um, because uh, these five boys take their own lives in their hands, li almost literally, um, to speak up and to run away. Uh, in both cases, on multiple occasions, from their captors. Uh, and when you are eight years old, when you are 10 years old, when you are 15 years old, the oldest boy is 15, the youngest child is, um, is eight, um, you're doing so with very little certainty about what awaits you when you run or what happens if you speak up to the wrong um, person in this chain of custody that turns a free child into a unfree um, slave in, in Mississippi, right? So they're, they're, they're facing extraordinary odds and it requires extraordinary, I think, boldness and courage to use that word uh, you used a moment ago um, uh, to do so. So I'll just point out that um, Sam, who's a 15 year old boy in this um, uh, story, uh, runs away uh, once, twice, three times uh, in this uh, story, which is incredible, even by the standards of, uh, you know, other attempts to resist and oppress uh, and oppose um, enslavement in other contexts uh, in the New World, uh, in the Americas. To do that repeatedly um, takes takes a lot. And then Cornelius, uh, the boy I began with uh, here, uh, Bonnie, the 10-year-old uh, child, uh, he will eventually um, find himself in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, um, which is a thriving uh, town that Cotton uh, built in the 1820s. Um, and he will make the boldest choice of his life to trust two white adults who for their own you know, quite selfish reasons decide to offer him help. Uh, and knowing which white people in Alabama to trust, of course, is an incredibly fraught question in a slaveholding state like Alabama, as you can imagine. And again, he's 10 years old. Um, so it takes all his wits uh, to figure out who to trust. Um, and when he does trust them, uh, they uh, work with him to actually get him into the legal system so he can advance what's called a freedom suit, a legal pathway to contesting the, his wrongful um, uh, enslavement. And for a 10 year old boy to then give testimony uh, in court, to name his um, uh, captors, to dredge up from his traumatized memory, everything, every name, every place that he can um, recollect. I mean, that is courage uh, uh, as well, right? Running away is courage, speaking up is courage. Courage takes so many different forms in the context of enslavement. And you will see, I hope, many of those different forms on display in the second half. And also um, the parents they've left behind uh, in Philadelphia are also major actors in this story. Mm. And all of us who are parents, we can readily understand some of what they're going through perhaps, but also all, uh, all the things they actually do to fight to get their own boys um, uh, free. Thank you, because I, I, I also appreciate the fact that you know their names, you know their families. I mean, the, the, the depth of your reason, because 
when you talk about them, you humanize them in that way. And exactly what you said, as a parent, as a grandparent or whatever, we can imagine our 10-year-old, 8-year-old, 15-year-old children um, in circumstances like this. And it really, I mean, it, it, it resonates, I think, with some of the things that we were seeing and talking about on the border in Texas um, over the last year. We were seeing children and these children have been unseen. And so uh, I think this does uh, help us see them. Rick, one of the things that we, we've said that this was part of our um, kind of Terrapin Strong initiative that is orienting people to the work we do in the college and um, issues of both how this in research informs notions of identity and also um, kind of what courses and things like that. So I, I would appreciate it if you just say a little bit about those two things, both maybe first identity, because that kind of flows out of the conversation that we've been talking about in some ways. And then a little bit about courses that you teach that are related to these topics. Yeah, let me try and thread that needle. There's a lot, there's a lot there, Bonnie. Um, <laughs> pick up on the, actually, the first thing you said before the question part of your comments there was this, you know, this notion um, that those of us who are parents and grandparents can maybe uh, readily see some of this experience through the eyes of some of the characters in this book. Um, there's a missing persons ad um, placed in a Philadelphia newspaper by Cornelius's dad, a great expense to him because he's poor. Uh, his name's Joseph. And he says, you know, um, if anyone can give any information to Cornelius's afflicted parents, which is him and his mm. wife, right? Um, you know, every time I read that, you know, I think of my four-year-old daughter and my seven-year-old daughter, right? If they were ripped away from me and my best hope was to place an ad in a newspaper, uh, that would remind me of my own powerlessness uh, as a parent to achieve what I hold most dear, which is getting my children back, right? So this definitely speaks to me um, uh, on that human um, uh, scale. Um, and as I said in the talk, it's a reminder of just how fragile black freedom was before the, the war. And as you pointed out, it's a reminder of just how fragile um, vulnerable families can be uh, today in the United States, around the borders of the United States, um, in all different um, contexts. And what's happening on the southern border over the last three years is not the only relevant context here, of mm -hmm. course, right? especially when we're thinking about black freedom and the vulnerability of legal freedom for African-Americans, right? Um, so all of that was, has been on my mind. Um, as I've been talking about this book around um, uh, the country. Um, and uh, it also informs my teaching. I can't remember which came first, the research for this book or the pivot I made to um, teaching African-American history. They both happened, you know, five, 10 years ago now. Um, and so a course, an, a big undergraduate course that I've developed over the course I've been working on this book um, is called Fighting Slavery. Uh, it's an I-series course, it's History 132. I'm teaching it right now. I'll hopefully be teaching it next fall. It's a large format enrollment, large uh, enrollment course, has about 150 great students um, in it. And that is about the anti-slavery fight from the perspective of people um, at its bleeding edge, right? This is the story of opposing slavery from the perspective of um, African-Americans, enslaved people, free black people, and occasionally their white allies. This is not an Abraham Lincoln top-down approach to the anti-slavery uh, movement. It's a reminder that as Ira Berlin, our late great colleague in the Department of History taught us, um, slavery um, was under attack by enslaved people from the very beginning. And without, you know, 200 years of those attacks between 1619 and 1865, slavery would not have died the death it did in the Civil uh, War. Enslaved people destroyed slavery more than any other single group of people we would care to name. And we would do well to remember that, um, I think. So that's the central message of my big I series course, Fighting um, slavery. And, you know, I've also been on a, you know, a modest journey uh, myself, right? Um, I'm a white guy, as everyone can see. Uh, I'm not from this uh, country. Um, uh, I was born in uh, Britain, and I've lived a life of extraordinary privilege. So all of this uh, research has been an opportunity to acknowledge and confront that 
um, uh, uh, privilege. So I have a long way to go uh, on that um, front, but my teaching, my research and my own identity for what that's worth have all sort of collided in this project. Thank you. Thank you, that's fabulous. Um, Linda, I'm gonna, I think we need, we have time now for some questions and we wanna open it up to the, there's thousands of things I could ask you, Rick. This has really been fascinating, but I wanna let other people ask questions as well. So Linda. Thank you very much. And at this time, if anybody has any questions for Professor Bell, please put them in the chat for me to share uh, with him. Um, and I, I see, I think somebody is raising their hand, but if you don't mind putting it in the chat, that would be easier. Um, let me start with the first one. Um, what important stories did not make their way into your book that you think are important to tell? <laughs> um, how, long that... we, how long do we have here? Um, <laughs> You know, uh, American history uh, is full of important uh, stories and drawing the line around any research project and figuring out what deserves to be in the pages in print between the covers uh, and what is uh, for another time has is, is been incredibly hard. So to, just to give you, you know, a, a, a narrow answer to that question, um, this book, uh, Stolen, focuses like a laser on the story of these five boys um, who are you know, captured from freedom and then enslaved and then try their damnedest to free themselves. Um, and as I've sort of suggested in my, my conversation with Bonnie and in my remarks to you, in the course of telling this one story of these five individuals, um, I try to make it very clear to readers that they're part of a larger phenomenon in which thousands, maybe tens of thousands of free African-Americans are also having their freedom um, stolen. So I toggle back and forth in the scale, right, between telling this story and reminding people of the scale of similar stories. Um, frequently, I'll draw in other individual stories as a way to illuminate some aspect of what these five individuals uh, are going through. So Solomon Northup appears a few times in this um, book, um, not least because readers are more familiar with Solomon Northup than they are with this story, and that can be a useful device to bring people in, um, but also because the sources I'm dealing with, as you can imagine, are extremely spotty and full of holes because you're dealing with criminal activity and you're also dealing with children as actors. Um, only one of these five boys could write, by the way. Think about what that means for the sources that are generated. Um, so sometimes I have to pull in other cases to illuminate certain things about which um, I can't be sure um, what happened in this particular case. Let me give you one example here. Um, Solomon Northup, who, uh, the adult in his mid thirties, um, is put on a ship traveling from, I think, Richmond, Virginia, round to New Orleans, whereas my five boys are made to walk across the country in a vaguely similar um, direction. Um, my five boys, in the sources I have from their own mouths, do not say much at all about the psychological experience of that forced migration. Um, but Solomon Northup, who was on a ship and who was in his mid-30s, so is different, does say a lot about the psychological experience, what he's thinking about as he's getting mile by mile further away from freedom and his loved ones. So I'd often turn to corroborating evidence uh, to illuminate things where I didn't have the boys' um, uh, own words. But I wanna remind folks that for all the hopefully detail and depth about this one story told and stolen, it's a memorial really to the thousands of other um, people who kidnapped into slavery who weren't able to mount a successful um, escape from it and whose stories and whose lives and experiences uh, might never perhaps be reconstructed in the same way because of the lack of um, post-escape sources. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions and so let me just also say if we run out of time I apologize but we do have the chat that will be recorded so maybe we can request Professor Bell after the fact to send something to all participants later. The next question, what kind of gender split was there in capturing children to sell into slavery? Were young females of childbearing age in high demand? Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, question. Uh, and in the book, you do get an answer to that question. I've also just got a, a new uh, scholarly article coming out uh, in, a, in a journal, which also addresses that question head on. Um, because if you hear a 15 minute book talk from me, you might think that, uh, oh, it's, uh, it's only you know, uh, young boys who are targeted by these uh, kidnappers. Readers of the book will know that there are actually two 
African-American adult women who also are forced to make this journey with the five um, boys. One of them um, was um, a purchased enslaved person. Another one was a kidnapped free adult woman. So there's actually seven, not five people who make this journey. It's important to say their names, Mary Fisher and Mary Neal. Um, there were plenty of girls, uh, young female uh, children who were also kidnapped by this gang and by many other gangs like it in exactly the same period between about 1808 and the coming of the Civil um, War. And that's because kidnappers were well aware that demand for young people of both sexes was incredibly robust um, in the Deep South, in the Cotton Kingdom. If any of you guys actually remember the movie 12 Years a Slave, you'll remember that one of the main cat characters is Patsy, um, uh, um, a uh, young girl um, played by Lupita uh, Nyong'o, the British Kenyan uh, actress who, who is amazing in that role. And the real Patsy was, I think, 13 years old when she came to that plantation and was put to work. And if you remember from the movie, she is the most valuable enslaved person on that cotton plantation because she possesses the perfect, sadly, mixture of skills you need to pick massive amounts of cotton, which is dexterity and stamina. This is not something that requires great physical um, bulk or to be able to bench press 200 pounds, right? Um, and Patsy as a teenager, 13, 14, 15 years old, uh, is representative of the overwhelming demand from enslavers who were cotton, um, growers um, for teenagers. And of course, we all know that there were other roles um, uh, involving sexual uh, assault and sexual exploitation uh, to which young girls and young African-American women um, were also exposed uh, to. That was true for Patsy and true for many others um, as well. So demand for girls is sadly equally um, robust. Um, the only news I can share here is that on the streets of Philadelphia, um, um, black boys were more likely to be the people out and about on any given day, which actually made them more vulnerable. Uh, they have found it harder to find work or find a place in school um, than their um, sisters and uh, cousins. Uh, and young girls were more likely to be uh, employed within homes, in interior spaces, often as domestics, um, for white families. And so they weren't literally out on, uh, out on the streets uh, and that gave them a modicum of protection. But I've got masses of evidence that it wasn't always enough. Thank you. Next question. I hear the violence and devastation in the stories of your book. As I listen to you, the word snatched comes to mind for me. I wonder, were there other titles that you considered for your book before settling on Stolen as the title? Yeah, yeah, there were. And naming this is hard, right? Um, this is a book we want people to buy and people to read. Uh, and not just all of us, uh, professors, graduate students, uh, campus uh, people. Uh, this was a book that before the pandemic, when airports still existed, Linda, uh, you could find it at bookstores. Um, and so it had to be, to use a sort of PR word, sort of grabby. Um, and uh, I didn't have final say over the title. Uh, I've got some, you know, some, some, some modest beef uh, with the title. It doesn't uh, allow me to recognize the two women who I just said um, were there, um, uh, for instance. Um, stolen suggests property um, rather than um, autonomy. Can you steal someone who is free? I don't, I don't know about that. So I had some beef with the title, but uh, I didn't get the final say. That's the nature of publishing a trade book. Uh, my, my own title, which also has its problems, was very different um, to that. And it was shot down repeatedly by people who knew what they were doing. Um, my, my title, as I recall it, was um, The Lost Boys a story of slavery and justice on America's reverse underground railroad. It's not much longer or shorter than the one we ended up with. And um, for, for many different people, the phrase, the Lost Boys uh, created more problems than um, anything else, right? We think of the Lost Boys of Sudan. Um, we think of a terrible, I think, vampire movie with Kiefer Sutherland from 1980, mm -hmm. um, and all sorts of other things coming to mind, which maybe are not what we were going for. And of course the boys were not lost, right? They had been kidnapped as well. So choosing titles um, is hard. Um, and we, what we, who's to say where we came down? Thank you. I think we have time for one more 
maybe a couple more. Can you say more about the legal standing of African American children in the legal system of Tuscaloosa and whether and how that case made changes in legal protection to children? Yeah, I mean, in the book, I say a lot more about that exact um, topic because uh, we get to see Cornelius, this 10 year old boy, go through the Tuscaloosa, Alabama uh, uh, legal system as an African American child living in slavery and trying to assert his wrongful enslavement. Hey, I'm actually free. Well, how do you prove that you're free? if you're in Tuscaloosa and you're in slavery, right? Uh, let me be clear, he does not have any free papers that he can wave around. Um, if he ever had any, his kidnappers tore them up a long time ago. Um, so all he has is his word. So um, you may know that um, African-American in, in enslaved people could not testify uh, in Southern um, courts uh, and in freedom suits, they could only give written um, depositions and it all had to be corroborated, validated by some white witness who could say, yep, that guy is 10 year old Cornelius Sinclair and I knew him when he was free back in Philadelphia. So where do those white people come from? Do they get teleported to Tuscaloosa? Do they just appear? Um, um, how are they identified? How are they contacted? Who brings them? Who pays for them? These sort of real obstacles to getting what they call a white witness, a living witness, a respectable witness down to Tuscaloosa are extraordinary. And it's the reason, Linda, why um, even though every slave state has a mechanism by which people who believe they are wrongfully enslaved can mount a legal case, a freedom suit, it's the reason why very few freedom suits actually occur, despite all the wrongful enslavement that is occurring, and it's another reason why most freedom suits fail because white witnesses who knew you back when do not miraculously teleport in to Natchez, Mississippi or Tuscaloosa, uh, Alabama, except for when they do. And one of those instances happens in this book. And I think uh, last question, can you say more about the so-called safe houses along the reverse Underground Railroad? What was the typical profile of those who were complicit in this crime? Yeah, we know actually a lot about uh, this particular pair of safe houses run by this particular gang on the Maryland Delaware line and other gangs had other safe houses in other places at other times. Um, these two safe houses are the family homes of the two gang leaders, Joseph Johnson um, and uh, Patty Cannon and her uh, husband, uh, Jesse. Um, and they're sort of staging posts that they use while they try to figure out what to do next with the people they've kidnapped. They want to dispatch them in batches. They want to sell them, ideally, to a corrupt slave trader in our area who will then smuggle them into the supply chain and pass them off as slaves. That doesn't happen in this case in Stolen, but that's what often happens, right? Northrop, remember, gets bought by a corrupt slave trader in Washington, D.C., and then um, laundered into the legal supply chain as a human being. Um, so these safe houses um, are in an underpopulated region on the border between two slave states. They're literally on the line. One house is right on the Delaware line, run ha one house is right on the Maryland side. And as you can imagine, if a sheriff comes calling in one direction, you just move them to the other uh, safe house and then back and forth and back and forth. I discovered an extraordinary letter, one of the key finds in this book was a letter from a private detective working for Philadelphia's anti-slavery group six years before the events in Stolen take place, where he'd been sent on a mission to those safe houses to raid them and to find within them an 11 year old child, black child named Sarah Hagerman who had been kidnapped and was believed to be being held out there. And this detective, his name is John Willits, does succeed in um, getting a warrant to search these properties and him and a policeman go and do just that. They do not find Sarah Hagerman because the gang has been tipped off that they are coming to look for Sarah and they've moved her off site for three hours. But what they do find is um, somewhere between 11 and 20 other bound, kidnapped, free black people on that site who they're not able to interview, whose names they're not able to collect and who therefore they're not able to liberate while they're there. And of course, uh, you can imagine if you come back later with a warrant with the right names on it, those people are long gone. So that letter provides extraordinary insight into what those safe houses were like inside, the scale of this particular gang's operations, and um, all the mechanisms by which this gang worked to make sure that um, they could keep doing this awful work. 
They could buy off sheriffs. They had informants all over um, the place. This was a monstrous and highly effective system, the reverse mm. underground mm. railroad. Thank you. Bonnie? Thank you so much, uh, Rick. This has really been uh, fascinating, informative. I'm sure many of us will be running out to buy the book if we haven't um, bought it already. Um, and I think it also provides, uh, as I said earlier, really interesting and important um, aspect of the story of slavery and enslavement in African-American history that we many of us may not have known before. So this is great work. We look forward to all of the other stories that um, uh, didn't get into this book, but the, that you will be working on, I'm sure, uh, over the next few years. Uh, so thank you for your work. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you all for uh, being here. Um, we look forward to uh, having you next semester and we'll give um, Dr. Bell the chat and he can um, reflect on your questions and communicate in whatever way it works out. So thank you again and have a good break, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Rick.